1.1 Applied Properties of Real Numbers. I want you to take a look at this comic and by the end of the lesson I want you to think about the question Why does pi say to E I'm closer to 3 than you are? And please just jot your answer down somewhere on this first slide. And let's begin with talking about the subsets of the real numbers. So within the real number system, we have rational numbers and irrational numbers. Within the rational numbers, we have natural numbers, whole numbers, and integers. The natural numbers are a subset of the whole numbers. And we say that because the whole numbers include everything that the natural numbers include and also zero. The natural numbers are just your counting numbers, one, two, three, and so on. The whole numbers include all the natural numbers and zero. Again, that's why we say that the natural numbers are a subset of the whole numbers. And then the integers are all of our counting numbers plus the negative ones and zero. And then we have the rational numbers. And you can kind of think of those as just taking the integers and making them into fractions. More formally, we say that the rational numbers can be written as quotients of integers. So that's like what I was saying, take those integers and make them into fractions. Quotients, remember, is a division sign. And when we actually do the division, if the number is in fact rational, then it can be written as a decimal that will either terminate, meaning it ends, or repeat with the same pattern over and over. And this same pattern is really the key there. That means the decimal would end in like 0.333 repeating or maybe 0.363636. You would see some type of pattern in the when you divided those numbers. And then we have the irrational numbers and those would be examples, some examples would be root 2, root 3, root 5, pi. And if you put that into your calculator and looked at the decimal equivalent, you would see that the decimal kept going on and on with no real pattern and it didn't terminate, it didn't end, it only stopped because the calculator ran out of room. So more formally we would say, they can't be written as a decimal that will terminate or repeat in so, a pattern. Let's look at some of these um, comics here. This first one, wow, they really love the natural numbers. That sign that he's holding up, that's just a symbol for the natural numbers. Another one that you should be familiar with is the real numbers, which we write like that. And then um, just some little comics on irrational numbers. What's this first one? Happy Pi Day. Hmm, it's only an approximation. Some folks are irrationally hard to please. So Pi is irrational, so he's irrationally hard to please. And then we have the other one that says, If we can't have a rational conversation, there's no point going on and on forever. So he says that to root five. Root five is an irrational number, and his decimal goes on and on forever with no distinct pattern, of course. We go to some special irrational numbers. And these are called transcendental numbers. They're a special type of irrational numbers, as we said, and we'll learn more about these at a later time. So we're going to learn a little bit more about what's so special about E and pi. Stay tuned. Let's go to some properties of addition and multiplication. Before we get into this, let me just um, introduce you to set notation and a little comic here, suggestive notation. For all, this is saying for all little r is an element of, and that was what we just learned, the real numbers, the big r. 
for all little r is an element of real numbers, okay? So this means is an element of. You might want to jot down a note if you're not familiar with that. So let's start this with saying if a, b, and c are real numbers. We can say if a, b, and c are elements of the real numbers. Then the closure property tells us that a plus b is an element of the real numbers, meaning that when you add two real numbers, the answer or sum is also a real number. So an example there would be, well, you know three is a real number. You know five is a real number. That by the closure property, we know three plus five, which is eight, is a real number. So that's all the closure property means. And we also have the closure property for multiplication, which says a times b is an element of the real numbers. So again, you know three is real, you know five is real. By the closure property of multiplication, we know three times five, which is 15, is a real number. With the commutative property, we say that a plus b equals b plus a, telling us that when we add, the order doesn't matter. I like to remember commutative by commute is like we move things around so the a and the b are moving around and that order doesn't matter as you just said. And commutative for multiplication is a times b is equal to b times a. All right, associative property. Let's start off with the comic over here. Okay, class, time to do some group work. But professor, I don't associate with them. I right, so associative property says that a plus b, you get that answer, and then add c to it, gives you the same answer as taking a, and then adding to it the sum of b plus c. So you see what she just said there? She said, do the quantity a plus b first, and then add c. And that's the same thing as a plus the answer to the quantity b plus c. And then we have the associative for multiplication, which is the same thing, only with a multiplication sign instead of an addition sign. The identity property is the number you can add to any number to get the number back again. So if you start with A, How under get a addition, back again? right. Okay. What do you add to A to get it back? Zero. Mm -hmm, good. And for multiplication, again you start with A, now you multiply by some number, and you get A back. What is that? One. Now we look at the inverse property, which uses the identity element. So we start again with A, but now what we want to end with is the identity element for addition, which is 0. So what do we have to add to A to undo it or to get 0? The opposite of A. That's right. Okay. What do we do for multiplication? We start with A. We want to now get 1. So dividing by A, which is the same thing as multiplying by its reciprocal, if you don't know that word, reciprocal. Okay, that's the same thing as saying A divided by A, A times 1 over A. Okay. And last is the distributive property, which uses both addition and multiplication, and it says A times the quantity B plus C is equal to A times B plus A times C. So it's called distributive because you need to distribute that A to both of the terms, and terms are anything that are separated by the plus sign. Right. We'll talk more about terms And later. there could be more than two terms within your parentheses. A gets distributed to all of them. Exactly. A gets distributed to each term.
Mm -hmm. All right, so the first question here that we're going to do is use properties and definitions of operations to show that 20 divided by x times x equals 20 when x does not equal 0. I need to say that when x does not equal 0 because thou shall not divide by 0 ever um, and justify each step. So we start with the left side of our equation and see how we can make it into the right side. So 20 divided by x times x can be rewritten as 20, and instead of division, we can multiply by the reciprocal times 1 over x times x. So we just rewrote the 20 divided by x as 20 times 1 over x, which we just learned about. That is just the definition of division, right? Right. Okay, now we can simplify that further by knowing that 1 over x times x is equal to 1 by what property? I think that was the inverse property of multiplication. Yes. And now we can go further because 20 times 1 is equal to? 20. And we know that because we know that 1 is the identity element for a multiplication. Also, um, look back here and think about some of these properties. And I want you to start thinking about what they hold for subtraction and division also. We're going to be talking about that in class. All right, next question. So. Part A, you work four hours to earn $60. What is your earning rate? So before we even begin, let's think about what units we want our answer to be in. It asks us for the earning rate. So the rate at which we're earning. What do you think that unit is going to be? Dollars per hour. Dollars per whatever unit of time they tell us here. It's hours, so dollars per hour. So that is a dead giveaway. We should do 60 dollars divided by four hours so that we have our proper units. We do 60 divided by four and we get? $15 per hour. All right, in the next question, you buy 16 gallons of gas at $3.45 per gallon. What is your total cost? What is total cost units gonna be in? The answer should then be in dollars. All right, so let's start with our 16 gallons. And we have dollars per gallon, which is great because if we have the $3.45 per one gallon, then gallons crosses out with gallons and we are left with dollars as our unit. And 3.45 times 16 is? $55.20. So if you put this on your calculator, you're going to get 55.2. Please make it appropriate. This is, we're working in dollars, so you should make it $55.20. All right, last one. You drive 85 kilometers per hour. What is your speed in meters per second? So here they give us the units. We want meters per second. So let's start with the only piece of information we have. We have 85 kilometers in one hour. Okay, but we didn't want hours, did we? We wanted? We want seconds. So do you know how many hours are in a second? How many seconds are in an hour? 3,600 seconds are in an hour. All right, so if you didn't know that, let's think about it. One hour is equivalent to what? One hour, so let's start with the one hour. And what do you know most easily about an hour? So an hour, we wanna get rid of hours. Let's convert hours to what's most obvious? 60 minutes. Okay, we know there's 60 minutes in an hour. Because we wanna get rid of hours, put an hour in the bottom, there are 60 minutes in an hour. The 60 goes with the minutes because there are 60 minutes in one hour. Okay, so now let's do minutes to seconds. And so we, we want to get rid of the minutes now and change them into seconds. So we write minutes on the bottom to cancel out with the minutes on the top. And there are 60 seconds in one minute. 60 seconds in one minute. Okay, now minutes cancel out and we have seconds. 60 times 60 is 3,600. So that's where you got 3,600 seconds in one hour from. 
Okay, so if you if you knew that, you could have done it immediately. You could have also put all this work down here. Whatever you want, it doesn't matter. All right, so now we want to cross out hours. So we should put hours on the top. So we can cross out hours. And we just learned in one hour there are 3,600 seconds. So the 3,600 has got to go with the seconds. All right, so now we have kilometers per second, but they asked us for meters per second. So we must change kilometers into meters. So. And I should put the kilometers, I want them to cancel out, so I need to put them in the bottom. And there are 1,000 meters in a kilometer. And there are 1,000 meters in a kilometer because kilo means a thousand and the metric system just makes a lot of sense. All right, so now let's see, you can, um, oh, we could cross out two of these zeros with two of these zeros, make it a little easier, put it in your calculator and you get 23.611 meters per second. Okay, and in this class, we're always going to be rounding to three decimal place accuracy, and I'm going to talk to you more about what three decimal place accuracy really means, but please just get in the habit of rounding to three decimal places. And that's it for this lesson. Bye.